Bucks going for their 12th consecutive win last night against one of the worst teams in the land, the New York Knickerbockers, who have lost six straight. And it did not take Yanni long to get his double-double. Only 12 minutes it took him, just a quarter, to get a double-double. Here he is backing down Bobby Portis. Bucks already up 11. A little turnaround Jay, and they're up 13 points. Second quarter, up 16. George Hill gets the inbounds and the stuff. They would lead by 47 points at one point in this game. Giannis saying usually teams tend to relax, but we don't do that. Here he is getting the rebound, taking it down himself. Coming around, getting it back, top of the key, splash. He had 16 and 10 in the first half. Only played 22 minutes in the game and scored 29 points, adding 15 rebounds as they cruise to another victory, their longest winning streak since 1982. Just look at the score here in the third as they close in on 100. DJ Wilson, exclamation point. Every Knicks starter was minus 25 or worse for the game. And during this winning streak, they are outscoring opponents by 15 points per game. They've done the majority of their damage in the paint. Run of the three-man weave with Rip Hamilton and Raja Bell. Do they still do that in practice? The uh, three-man weave? Yeah. yeah kids yeah, doing that? Yeah. My yeah. team doesn't do it so well, but <laughs> we try. Yeah, we give a shot. All right, the Milwaukee Bucks. I doubt they're running many three-man weaves in NBA practices, but the Bucks are hot. They've won 12 in a row. Last year's team had the best record in the NBA, fellas. Is this team better than last year's? Uh, I'm not ready to say they're better. Uh, they're better at some things. Uh, they're fractionally better offensively this year than they were last year. Um, they're fractionally worse defensively this year than they were last year. It's clear, though, that Giannis has taken another step in terms of uh, rounding out his game, his ability to score you know, from different areas of the floor. He's stretching a little bit more with the three-point shot. Um, ultimately, I think you see a result here of a soft schedule right now, and I don't mean to take anything away from what the Bucks have done, but in this stretch of 12 games, the only playoff team uh, is Indiana in there. Um, so I think they've caught a nice soft schedule. They are playing great. They're a little bit better at some things, a little worse at other things. They're ultimately a really, really good team. And I do think they could win a championship, but I'm not ready to say that they're actually better than they were last year. Yeah, and this is what I expected from them, especially losing a heartbreaker last year in the playoffs against the Toronto Raptors. Yeah, they're scoring a little bit more. They're averaging 120 points a game this season, which leads the NBA, which they did the same exact thing last season, averaging 180. 18, but I would say the jury's still out with that. I think they're going to be judged if they can get over the hump and, and, and go to the NBA Finals. Giannis is playing at an MVP level. I mean, you see a stat line averaging 30 and 13 points a game. And then they added more shooting on the team. A lot of people make a big deal about Malcolm losing Malcolm Brogdon to Indiana, but then you add sharpshooters like Kyle Korver. And Wesley Matthews is no punk on the court. You know, he's a hard-nosed defender, a guy that can match up uh, and play multiple positions on the defense end, and he can knock down the three. So I think it all depends on could Eric Bledsoe show up in big games, especially in the playoffs. That's going to determine if this team is better than uh, last season. And to Raja's point on the soft schedule, they should run that to 13 straight tomorrow night. They have the Detroit Pistons who are sitting at 7-13. and 13. The Utah Jazz went out and got Mike Conley in the offseason. They got off to a pretty good start, but a 1-4 and four road trip, and they did not look good in the last couple of games. Last night, losing on the road at Philly. Well, last year, I mean, uh, the game against Toronto, they were down by 40 points at the half. And when you're when you're thinking about saying to this, to, saying to yourself, or is this team a contender? Can this team make it to the Western Conference Finals? You cannot be getting blown out by that. Last year, they they were eighth in, in assists, and they had Ricky Rubio, Ricky Rubio at the point guard position. This year, they're 27th in assists, which is 21 uh, in, in the NBA right now. And they thought they had an upgrade at that position. Uh, Michael Conley is definitely struggling at the point guard position. You got to remember in Memphis, everything evolved around him on the offense and he kind of ran the offense. Uh, he was the first first and second option on that team and he had his role was to try to get everybody's involved. 
this year playing against playing with the Utah Jazz, you got a guy like Donovan Mitchell. He's a ball dominant player. So Michael Conley is, is not being able to get off like he was when he played for the Memphis Grizzlies. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think you hit a good point there. Mike, Michael Conley's being played a little bit, you know, out of character mm -hmm. in terms of what he's used to doing, having the ball in his hands. Not only do you have Donovan Mitchell, but you have Bojanovic there also, who's a ball dominant type of guy, needs the ball in his hands. Joe Ingles is also struggling offensively because of those pieces uh, coming out and really trying to put an offensive stamp on who uh, the Utah Jazz are. I, I, the same way I didn't want to panic a, a, about Milwaukee um, and, and, and crown them champions of the NBA right now. I, I don't want to do that necessarily to Utah either because they were on a five game road trip. Um, it's a weird time of the year around Thanksgiving. You know, you got a lot of stuff going on and I'll, they're not playing great, but it was a tough schedule and they lost mm -hmm. to Milwaukee, Indiana, Toronto and the 76ers. All of those are really, really good teams. And so, yeah, they have their flaws. Rip, you touched on a lot of them. Um, they have to figure out how they can move that ball um, and share it a little yeah. bit more and get back to the way Utah played last year, where it was really hard to figure out where those points were going to come from from night to night. I think that makes you more dangerous uh, offensively. But they are also a victim of scheduling right now. That's a tough road trip. You played some really, really good teams. They are back home, but they've got the L.A. Lakers, who just had their 10-game winning streak snap that game tomorrow night in Utah. Uh, the Western Conference Player of the Week was not James Harden, who averaged 47 points per game. It was Carmelo Anthony, who averaged 22 points per game. Somebody just doing him a favor in the offices, or what, what do we have here? <laughs> I, I don't, look, I think that... It, it's a great story for the NBA. Um, a guy coming back off of a two-year layoff like that, yeah. uh, being reinserted into a team, and not only getting buckets, but having the team uh, respond to those buckets in, in, in terms of wins. You know, I think it's a great story, but, you know, James Harden, clear candidate, probably should have won it. I'd also throw Luka Doncic in the mix of a guy who could have won uh, the award last week. So, you know, clearly someone um, is feeling yeah. Carmelo Anthony, and I'm not taking anything away from it. It's an awesome story. I'm happy for him. I'm happy for Portland. I just think there were other guys out there maybe a little a little bit more deserving of the award and what we talked about too Roger when when, when Carmelo first came out everybody expectation wise you know cameras was on him everybody thought okay is Melo gonna be the same Melo that he was five years ago and I said you can't judge him on the first game wait till we get five to ten games into the season that's when you can judge Carmelo Anthony he's been shooting the ball lights out I mean from the three-point line he's been shooting almost uh, 45 percent from the three-point line and if he can continue continually knock down shots and Portland can get healthy I think that's the big thing if they can help get healthy they needed a spark on their team right anytime you're you're you're, you're struggling offensively and defense when you get a new guy coming into the locker room, especially with the credentials as a Carmelo, a Carmelo Anthony, it brings that type of excitement and that kind of it factor that you need for your team. I think they're playing well right now, and I think Melo's well-deserving of that award, just the simple fact that he's been out for two years. Okay, well, they've got the Clippers tonight. That game is in Los Angeles. Zion Williamson uh, still not back on the practice floor. Now, this was the, the supposed to be the opening to the window where he could return. It's been over six weeks since that injury and it was a six to eight week timetable Alvin Gentry as head coach says I think he's fine I don't think it's anything that can be rushed when the time comes for him to start on court and do things like that he will it's not anything that's going to be rushed it's a matter of taking the time to make sure he's fine in these situations you sometimes have to protect players from themselves I would have to agree with that I mean Zion you know coming into a new year new season now an 82 game season it's totally different than playing college basketball now you're playing against the best and most athletic players in the world and when you got a guy like Zion and you're watching uh, all the different highlights and you see in the John Morantz and all these other young kids coming out playing as well as they are especially early in the season you want to come out and make an impact right from the beginning so they know yeah as a coach you got to save the player from himself because his expectation wise he wants to come out and be an all-star. I mean, you sign a big deal with Brand Jordan. Uh, he's probably coming with the most hype since LeBron James. This is a guy that's a difference maker for your ball club, but it allowed a guy like Brandon Ingram to shine on that ball club and other young guys to perform at a high level. Well, that's what's going to be really interesting to me, and I, I agree with you 100%. Like, you have to err on the side of caution with that. You've got too much invested uh, in Zion, and, and hopefully one day he becomes the player that everyone thought he could be. But it doesn't really make sense to rush that, mm -hmm. right? There, you, you would hope that you have a whole career uh, to see Zion's brilliance. So right now, make sure that he's healthy. Make sure that the, the weight is under control. When you're injured like that, you put on a few pounds anyway. If you have a player that, that's naturally a little heavier, he's probably going to put on a few more than anyone else would. So make sure that that weight's in check and you've got a guy that, that has, everyone has signed off on coming back and playing. I'm interested to see what they look like and how Zion responds in the in the Robin role. Because mm -hmm. right now, Batman is Brandon Ingram. He is playing fantastic. He's 
possibly the most improved player in the league right now. Um, and if you were Zion, you had to think that coming into this year, you were going to be the guy that they ran everything through. You were yeah. the first pick in the draft. Uh, all the hopes were going to ride on you. And right now, um, when you reinsert him back in that lineup, he's got to understand that Brandon Ingram is really cooking right now, and he's doing it against everybody. He's doing it night in and night out. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to be interesting to see if he can take that kind of backseat role, if you will, you know, when he gets dropped back uh, into playing. Ingram and the Pelicans hosting Luka and the Mavs tonight. And there's a couple really good matchups at the top of each conference. We have one versus two in the West, and we have two versus three in the East. That one versus two is Lakers at Nuggets tonight. Yes, the Nuggets are in that number two position right behind L.A. I would have to go with the Heat and the Raptors. I mean, both teams are playing exceptional basketball. I mean, I didn't expect the Toronto Raptors to be this great this early in the season, but both teams are great at home. And with Nat, with Toronto getting this game at home, I might have to give the edge to Toronto because both teams are undefeated playing on their home court. Yeah, that's a great story. Pascal Siakam is, is one of my favorites for any award you want to throw out there. I mean, he's just kind of taking the bull by the horns um, in Kawhi's absence. I'm going to go with the Laker game against Denver. I, I'd like to see how the Lakers respond to, to losing to Luka and them at home. I want to see if Denver's really figured it out. I think they stumbled out of the gate a little bit, uh, but they've hit their stride. So I'm interested to see how this plays out. This could be a Western Conference championship. I don't believe that that ultimately the Heat uh, and Toronto will both make their way to the Eastern Conference Finals. Both of these teams could make their way Hold to on, the Western Conference Hold on, you said Denver Finals. to the Western Conference Finals? Potentially. Okay. Yeah. Potentially. Okay. A little potentially. caveat. Okay. Yeah. Right. They've got a, a better asterisk. chance of doing that than the Heat doing the Eastern okay. Conference. Um, uh, uh, we'll see. Okay. Our producer, Mayrone, <laughs> doesn't want to hear that. He is a big <laughs> Miami fan and very surprised and happy with the way they've played so far this season. Rip Raja, thanks for the time. No